All right, good morning. If you have a Bible, it's open to Daniel chapter 9. Been doing a verse by verse study through the book of Daniel. Amazing chapter. Chapter 9 is that, that really, in, in many ways, confirms the inspiration of the Bible. Sometimes people might ask you, you know, why do you believe in the Bible? One of the reasons is because of prophecy that has not only yet to be fulfilled, but has been fulfilled over and over again. And as we'll see today, actually in a very precise way, God's Word, the Bible, has this divine power to predict events far in the distant future. And this happens in chapter 9. And it's, uh, it's an amazing passage that really actually identifies when the Messiah would show up in Jerusalem and present himself as Messiah. A, a learned rabbi was a moderator on a debate between a Christian and a Jew about prophecy. This was going on in the 17th century, this debate. And as the Christian pressed the details of Daniel Chapter 9, it, it was so pointed to Jesus that the rabbi stood up and he closed the debate with these words. He says, let us shut our books, bring our time to an end, for if we go on examining prophecy, then we'll all become Christians. And I thought, yeah, that's right. And the prophecy that we're looking at today is not a dream. It was given to Daniel by a direct message by Gabriel, the angel that was the same angel that appeared to Mary and Joseph in the New Testament. Gabriel was sent to Daniel to give him a clear and powerful look into the future. It's an answer to prayer. And, and you might remember, as we saw last week, that, that Daniel tells us the exact time that this occurred. In chapter 1 of verse 9, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Asarias, of the lineage of the Medes. So it's a time when the Medes and the Persians are ruling and reigning. The Babylonian Empire has been taken over. And so Daniel would probably at this time be in his late 80s, early 90s. Daniel's been praying for the restoration of Israel now for over 70 years. And I'm not in my late 80s or early 90s, but my wife and I, I was out of town uh, for a little bit, went to look at this uh, Calvary Bible Institute. A guy called me up and said, hey, would you guys ever be interested in starting a Calvary Bible Institute in your area? I know, John, you've got 40 years of experience. Your son is kind of transitioning into the pastoral role, and, and we would love to start one in your area. We've got one in uh, California. There's possibly going to be one in Atlanta. There's one in Uganda. There, there's one in Guatemala, and he starts, there's one in the Philippines. He starts naming them all. So, well, tell me about it. Well, it's a year-long program where we really focus in on the students learning the scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation. They learn how to do funerals and weddings. And we really equip them and try to place them after one year, either as an assistant or a church plant, depending on their age. I said, yeah, well, I would, I would love to come out and chat with you about that. So if any of you have a free building to house students, <laughs> we're, we're up for it. So we're praying this thing through. And... Um, so I get back, uh, my plane was actually delayed, I got back late uh, Monday night, and um, I had to speak Sunday at a church there in a place called Ukaipa. A friend of mine, Chris Fraley, uh, pastors a church there, and he said, John, if you come out, would you speak? I go, yeah, I would, I'd be happy to. What he didn't tell me was they had a Saturday night service, and then four Sunday morning services. Start at 7.30 in the morning, and you got out of there about 1.45 or 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And I said, you have four Sunday services? 
You got four Sunday services, and the place seats about 600 people, and it's packed every service. Saturday night was completely packed. The only service that was kind of not was the very last service, which, which had about 300 people in it. And so at the end of it, I asked one of the guys, the pastor was out of town, I go, this is amazing. What is, the Lord's really doing something powerful here. He goes, yeah. He goes, the Sunday after Easter, he said, we baptized 186 people. I know. Isn't that amazing? I said, kind of hung my head and said, we only baptized 80-something people. <laughs> you know. He's, so, so, but I get home, and, and so my daughter, whose husband just got out of the Navy, we had promised them a year ago we would watch their three kids while they kind of got away for, I didn't realize it was eight days, but it's eight, <laughs> eight days. And so when I got home, they were there already. They're sleeping. And they woke up the next morning. But so we've had them from, um, I guess, Sunday night. They, they get, their parents get back Monday evening. So when I said he was 70, 80 years old or 90, I feel like I'm 90 years old now after watching these three kids. And it's, I don't know, it's a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old. So, and they're very verbose individuals. So I'm driving the two boys, that's the six and the five-year-old, to school every morning here. They go to school here. And it's Highway 98, it's getting them in their car seats, it's you know, making sure they have their lunches, their backpacks, all this stuff. And, and then you get out on the Highway 98 and the traffic, as you know, it's just crazy. The red lights seem to last forever and I'm in a hurry, I'm running late and I'm like, come on, come on. And I hear this voice from the six-year-old in the back goes, Pop, patience. <laughs> and then he says this, it's a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> I'm like, what? And, and then the little girl, she, she, she sings this, one of the songs we sing here over and over. Uh, Waymaker, miracle worker. And, and I was trying to sing it with her, and I missed uh, promise. She goes, it's promise keeper. Like, okay, okay, okay. So... so I've been schooled this week pretty much, and it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, and Lynn, Lynn has, my wife had had foot surgery recently, so we've been trying to navigate these kids. And um, I say all that to say this, that there is an end to things, and there's prophecy tells us about that <laughs> today. And, and there's, there's coming an end to, to the, our time here on earth, and there's coming an end to uh, what's happening in Daniel's life. And he, it says it's, it's a very specific time. He's praying for deliverance from captivity that he's been in for almost 70 years, taken by the Babylonians as a very young man. It's amazing prayer of confession and praise and, and petition that Neil shared with you last week. And his prayer is interrupted, if, if you are there in Daniel chapter 9, in verse 20. Now while I was speaking, praying, and here's what he's praying. I'm confessing my sin, and he's praying for the sin of my people, Israel. He's praying for himself. He's praying for his nation. And presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, which would be the temple mount where the temple is. So he's, so he's confessing his sin, praying for Israel, and praying for Jerusalem. That's what he's praying for. And, and he's interrupted as he's praying. And while I was speaking, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your prayer, your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Da Daniel, I'm going I'm to tell you what's going to go down uh, and I want you to think it through. I want you to understand. And just like Jesus said, and this, this is really 
basically some of the same uh, scripture that Jesus speaks of in, in the Gospel of Matthew. I'll just read it for you when he's talking to his disciples because what Daniel gets to see and understand has to do with the end times. It has to do with not only Jesus showing up, coming into the city of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, but it also has to do with the last seven years of time on earth. And Jesus says to his men about that time, that last seven years, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads... Let him understand. So Gabriel says understand. Jesus says understand this same specific issue. And the passage that we're about to look at in Daniel chapter 9, many have said is kind of like the central backbone of prophecy in Scripture. And there are two general parts, and they're all found here in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, where it says... Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And then it says to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now, he goes on and he says, Know therefore, and here it is, understand, that from the going forth of the command, and this is, a, this is a, a, a starting point, a time frame. The going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again, what's talking about the streets of Jerusalem and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And this is, this is a, a, a last week. This is that time at the end. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So there's a specific time period, 70 weeks of years. And we know a week of days is seven days. A week of years would be seven years. And there are 70 periods of seven years. So if you multiply 70 times seven, we have 490 years. Your people... Holy city, nation of Israel, city of Jerusalem is going to be around during that prophecy. It must be Jerusalem. And there's this list of things that, that will occur. First it says, to finish the transgressions, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity. How does that happen? Well, when Jesus shows up, at the appointed time, then it's followed by the crucifixion. If anyone be in Christ, old things pass away, sin pass away. Behold, all things become new. By grace are you saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So there comes an end of our transgressions. They're, they're wiped clean, if you will, by Jesus Christ. And then there's the next ones that deal with hopes, and dreams of mankind, where it talks about uh, not only the, the end of iniquity, but also everlasting righteousness. The kingdom of God will be established here on earth for, for a millennial. And it's kind of like the fulfillment of the Lord's prayer. Lord, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Think how long that prayer has been prayed by Christians all over the world. And then seal both the vision and the prophet. And the, and the Hebrew word seal means to complete it, to bring it to an end. The prophecy would complete. And anoint the most holy place. The most holy place in Israel would be, well, the temple. 
So everlasting righteousness, kingdom of God come, complete the prophecy, seal it up, anoint the most holy place, the temple. So a temple must be built, Jerusalem, for the 490 years to be fulfilled. So the prophecy covers 490 years, and at the end, the problem of sin is dealt with. Daniel, this is how it's going down. So, so in verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. So there's a starting point. There's a command to go and restore and build Jerusalem. A, a time when a decree will go forth to build the city and its walls. So Gabriel says the starting point of that 490 years is a time when a decree should go forth to build the city and walls of Jerusalem. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, several decrees by Persian kings, but two of them clearly relate to the building of the temple, and the temple was rebuilt before the city walls were restored. The only one decree, listen, in Nehemiah, and we, we, we looked at Nehemiah uh, in the past, that gives permission to rebuild the walls and the city of Jerusalem, this decree is precisely dated in Scripture. During the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes, that date can be pinpointed to 445 B.C., and that's the starting point for the 490 years. Now, that 490-year period, according to Angel, would be in two parts, seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven weeks of seven years is 49 years. And during that 49 years, the city would be rebuilt with streets, with walls. And in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, it said, Knowing, therefore, that from the coming forth, the restore and build the Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there should be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The streets will be built and the wall even in troublesome times. So... 62 weeks of years, 434, you add this to the 49, and you, and you come to the 483 years. The coming one here is called the anointed one, a prince, and it's the Hebrew word for Messiah. So basically, Messiah, prince, Gabriel says, from the going forth of the decree to the building of Jerusalem, seven weeks and 62 weeks are 483 years, Precise timetable. It begins in 445 BC, add 483 years, and you come to 32 AD. And Jesus rides into, listen, he rides into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. They're waving the palm fronds, they're shouting Hosanna, and he fulfills uh, the prophecy of Zechariah. 9-9. Nine, nine. You guys know that prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's just having salvation. He's going to bring an end to his sin and iniquity by dying on the cross, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And according to Daniel's prophecy, he came in on the exact date that was prophesied by Daniel 500 years earlier. And listen to, to, to Luke chapter 19. In verse 41, it says, Now, this is when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He drew near. He saw the city. And what did he do? He, he, he didn't rejoice. He wept over it. And this is what he said. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. He expected them to know. They studied the scriptures. They knew the scriptures. But it says they're hidden from your eyes because their heart was so far from God. And, and it tells us, for days will come upon you and your enemies will build an embankment around you. Surround you, close in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Here, here's the deal. This had been so precisely prophesied 
for them to miss it causes Jesus to weep and, and to, to just realize that they have completely missed what God had intended them to receive. They should have known. They should have been looking. They prided themselves on knowing the scripture. In John chapter 5, there, there's this statement, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. They, they knew the scriptures. They memorized large sections of, of, the, of the early scriptures, and yet they didn't recognize Jesus. And we read what happens in, in chapter 9 of Daniel, verse 26. As his prophecy goes forth to Daniel, and after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and it, of it shall be a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So the gospel records is one of a week of seven days after the triumphal entry that Jesus was crucified. In John chapter 1, verse 10, it tells us this, that he was in the world, the world was made through him, the world did not know him. He came to his own, prophesied that he would come on a very specific date, and they did not receive him. And then there's this mysterious last week that deals with the very end of time, the last seven years of time. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and really the last week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring to an end the sacrifice and the offering. It's speaking here of, of the last seven years of time during the, the, the Antichrist. And the, the wing of the abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This final week, this last week, this seven years, when, when scholars believe that it'll be an, an end, of, end of all things as far as the, 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 the world united by an antichrist. And in Matthew uh, chapter 24, I'll just read this. It says, once again, quoting Daniel, when you see the abomination of desolation, this is that last verse there in Daniel chapter 9. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And, and, he, and he says, uh, whoever reads this, let those who are in Judea flee. To, let him who sits on the housetop not go down, take anything out. And let him who's in the field not go back. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing. Happy Mother's Day, babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For there'll be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. It, it's, it's a difficult time for the world and especially for Jerusalem. A temple will be built. A leader will arise. There'll be a covenant with many, the Antichrist. And, and, and in the book of, of, of Acts, let me just read this to you. Acts chapter 3, it says, You... Yet now, brethren, I know you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. Repent, therefore, it says, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, done away with. So times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you, before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Israel. I've taken several groups over there many times. But there's one very interesting place that we go to when we go especially to Jerusalem. And it's a place called the Temple Institute, and it's amazing. You go in there, and in this room, they have rebuilt all the articles of the temple. They have the priest's garments. They have the menorah. They, they have all the things, the table of showbread, everything. Now they have the red heifers that have been sent over there, that they burn these red heifers and use the ashes to... to uh, 
cleanse the priests from any kind of sin so that sacrifices can be made. And the whole stage is set for the temple to be rebuilt. And we're living in a time uh, when, who knows, this, this whole war that's going on right now with Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, it could bring about some kind of treaty that would allow the temple to be rebuilt again. And if it is rebuilt again, then we're right in probably the edge of time before the rapture occurs and before this time of desolation comes forth. I mean, we live in a time that's like no other, I believe. I mean, how many of you, have, have you heard of any wars or rumors of wars going around? Everywhere you tune in almost, it's happening. And, and America, I mean, before the Lord returns, it talks about Israel being all on its own with no allies that everyone has turned its back on. And, and I, you know, America has always been an ally of Israel. But right now, I don't know if you watch or listen to the news about all the different anti-Semitic marches that are going on in our universities all over our country. It's the most bizarre thing I think I've ever seen. They just had one recently, I believe, in Boston where they're, where they're actually crying for infatata, which is basically terrorism. And you're like going, do they even know what they're talking about? And they're saying, no Zionists on our streets. That basically says what? No Jews on our streets. Who, who in the world has the, the right to tell the Jewish people they don't have a right to walk on our streets? And you're, you're seeing this anti-Semitism sort of evolving in America in, 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 a, in a way it's never been seen before. And we've got this border issue that's going on. I, I don't think, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not 80 or 90, but I've lived a long, a long enough now to go, you know what? I've never seen an America like the America you and I are living in. Have you? It's crazy. I mean, uh, n number one would be this whole thing that's going, and, and this is hopefully not offensive to anyone, uh, this crazy thing called gender confusion. Is that confusing? It is in our culture today. The, 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 it, it's, it's this political confusion that's going on, instability of the economy, the, the moral decay of our culture. You know, I grew up here in Pensacola, Gulf Breeze, and uh, as I just look at what's happening in the world, and especially in America, it's kind of scary. At the age of 13, my, my, my older brother Yancey was, was um, at 16, got really involved in surfing. My mom was divorced. We had one car and five kids. She wouldn't take us to the beach. She had to work. So we wanted to hitchhike. Well, I didn't really, but Yancey did. I was 13. And so in order for him to be able to go to the beach, we lived on 17th Avenue off of Blunt Street. We walked down to the bridge, and my mom said, Yancey, the only way I'll let you hitchhike is if John goes with you. <laughs> so here I am, 13 years old with my older brother, and we're hitchhiking to the beach. Now here's the question. Would you let a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old today hitchhike to the beach? You'd never see them again. But there we were. That's the world we were living in back then. We, we live in a day like, like no, no other. I think we're in a countdown period where what we're seeing and reading in Daniel chapter 9 is going to occur one day. I was in a conference recently back in February for the Calvary chapels in Florida, and guys come from all over, and uh, this guy named Don McClure was speaking. He, he is in his 80s, but still very sharp, very, very concise in his teaching. And he's teaching uh, about the, 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 the coming of the Lord and different things that are happening, and he starts talking about things God takes out of your life. And he, he goes, you know, things are different. He goes, you know, I've lost this, I had to have this shoulder replaced, I had to have this knee replaced. Then he said, I had to have this knee replaced, I had this shoulder replaced, this hip replaced. He says, I'm blind in one eye. And then he goes, if it keeps going like this, I could run for president. <laughs> and, 
And then he goes like this. <laughs> I'm like, and that's another whole thing that's going on in our country, this whole political craziness that's going on. And you've got these two guys running for president, and everybody's going, what? Is this for real? Is, is, is this happening? And so I'm talking to Don after. I said, Don, you, you've lived a long time. You've been a pastor for a long time. Tell me what you think are some of the real signs of the fulfillment of prophecy and the coming of the Lord. He goes, well, you know, John, we've always had wars. We've always had rumors of wars. We've, we've had earthquakes and, you know, all these other kinds. We've had alcohol and, and drugs. And, you know, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, I saw a lot of change happen then with music and with politics and assassinations. And 1969, landing on the moon. So all that go down, Woodstock, the Beatles, all this stuff happening. And he saw it as well. But he says, you know what? No, it's... The most concerning thing to me right now, I, I go, what? He goes, I've never, he says, I've seen, you know, we've always had a lot of evil, he said, but the thing I've never seen so prominent as I see now is the way the enemy has come after our children. He said, in a way I've never seen it before. He said, not only just with the sex trafficking and and gender confusion, and, and all this LGBT, and now they're trying to say, how do you even define a woman or a man? And imagine how confusing that is to a small child that's trying to come up in a, in a world and figure, I mean, at six or seven, you don't know, you can't hardly figure anything out. But now he says that the, the, the enemy is, is, is robbing them of their innocence and all the different things that go on with with kids and the stuff they're exposed to on phones and all this. He says, I've never ever seen anything like this before where the enemy has come after the innocent children in the way he is right now. And I agree with that. I mean, this is a time like no other. And I mean, I, I, we're watching these three kids all week and um, we live in a cul-de-sac. And I would know... I would not even let them go out in the cul-de-sac unless Lynn and I were sitting on the front porch. And it's four feet from our front door. I'm like, no way. I mean, when I was a kid, they threw us outside. <laughs> Don't come home till the street lights come on, you know, that kind of thing. But, but I tell you what, we don't live in that world anymore. He said, John, why, why are you saying all this? I'm saying all this because I think we're living in a day that's like no other and we're in the countdown, and the Bible is true, and Jesus came, just as it was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, and he died on the cross to put an end to sin, and he's coming back again. And we're living in a time where I think we're ripe for the rapture, and Jesus died, he rose again, the church was born, and you know, before the book of Acts, there was nothing known as the church. There, there was the Jews and the Gentiles, and the Jews would proselyte Gentiles into their faith, but there was nothing where they mixed together as a church. You and I are living in an age where there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor freeman nor, nor barbarian nor Scythian, that, that, that we're all one in Jesus Christ. And here's the wonderful thing. We get to be a part of something that is completely unique on the face of the earth, and it's called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. And we have a very specific mission together to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to stand up for righteousness. Now listen to what, I want to just kind of close with this when Daniel was praying, because I love this. Daniel was praying for, for some very specific things. While I was speaking, verse 20, I was praying and confessing my sin. Anybody got any sin in their life? Oh, you're all holy people. And then he says, I, I'm, and I'm praying for the sin of my people, Israel. He's praying for himself, and he's praying for his nation, that, that God would restore them, that God would forgive them. And he says, and I'm praying for the holy mountain of my God. That would be Israel. 
That would be the place where Jesus would come and where he would be sacrificed. And, and so it's a very significant, it's a very pointed kind of prayer, just as a prophecy is very significant and very pointed. And so, so here, here's the thing. Here's what I would like to do before we leave. In the midst of where we are living now and what's going on in our world and our culture and my life and your life, I would like for us to, to pray about our own sins. I would like for us to pray for our nation. And I would like for us to pray for the nation of Israel where Jesus will one day return and rule and reign.